Mart McDonald. I'm the Gordon and Patricia Gray Chair in Particle Astrophysics Emeritus at Queen's University, former director of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, for which I received the Nobel Prize for the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, a collaboration with 250 of my collaborators. So the focus of my research has been fundamental science. It's been, how can I understand at a very fundamental level how the universe works today? And in fact, how did it evolve from its origin? The Big Bang uh, is a big part of the uh, uh, story we think today is the way in which the universe has evolved. And the research I've been doing, which is in a field called particle astrophysics, uh, is a study of things where particle physics and astrophysics come together. Studies of the fundamental laws of physics at the very basic level, the individual constituents that make up matter and, and the interactions that occur to create the world around us, but also how those things influence how the universe has evolved from its very early days. It turns out that you can learn things in those two areas, particle physics and astrophysics, that play off each other. It has to work overall between the two of them, and a discovery in one area can help you in understanding the other area. And uh, even today, we've moved from the study of neutrinos to the study of the dark matter that on a starry night occupies those dark regions you see between the stars and amazingly has on the order of five times as much mass as what you see in the glowing regions. A big question in physics, both at the fundamental level, because it doesn't fit in the basics at all, as we know them today, and at the astro astrophysics and astronomy level, because we really don't understand how it has influenced. In, we, know, we know that it influences the evolution of the universe, but we don't really know what it is and therefore how it has influenced it exactly. So the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory uh, collaboration came together first in 1984. There were about 16 of us. We were working on an idea that originally came from Herb Chen from the University of California at Irvine. We worked with him as one of the co-spokesmen along with George Ewan at Queens who had been looking for the ultimate low radioactivity laboratory, which typically involves going underground. In this case, George had identified a location in Sudbury that uh, was two kilometers underground and that rock uh, essentially reduced the cosmic radiation that makes your atmosphere glow like the Northern Lights to almost nothing. And so we were able to build a large experiment that is the size of a 10-story building because neutrinos are extremely difficult particles to detect and avoid having it glow like the Northern Lights as it would if it were on the surface. Neutrinos are very basic particles along with electrons and quarks. They're the three types of particles we don't know how to subdivide any further. They only interact through the weak interaction. They can penetrate very long distances through uh, materials uh, and therefore they can come out from the core of the sun where they are produced in very large numbers by the nuclear reactions that power the sun. By building an enormous detector to observe them, we are able to look directly into the core of the sun and determine how the sun burns. The Sudbury Neutrino Observatory consisted of a thousand tons of heavy water situated in a detector two kilometers underground in Inco's Creighton Mine, a very active nickel mine to this day, which enabled us to shield out the cosmic rays, essentially remove them from interfering with our measurements. One of the lowest radioactivity locations ever created in the world at the center of our detector. The detector was the size of a 10-story building. The center of it was a thousand tons of heavy water. 
When a neutrino interacts with heavy water, it produces small bursts of light. We were able to detect those bursts of light with an array of 10,000 light sensors surrounding this central volume of heavy water contained in a plexiglass or acrylic container. All of this was contained in a very large cavity, 22 meters in diameter, 34 meters high, size of a 10-story building. And that light water within that cavity, outside the photomultipliers and heavy water, provided us with shielding against radioactivity from the walls of the cavity. So we had in the middle one of the lowest radioactivity locations ever obtained. And we were able to see the faint bursts of light that are produced by neutrinos from the sun, which only came once an hour. Imagine doing this on the surface where the atmosphere glows like the northern lights and so would our detector. By going so deep underground, we prevented that from happening and we were able to reliably detect these faint bursts of light and determine properties of neutrino, neutrinos in the process. One in 6,000 of the water molecules that we drink is heavier than the other molecules. Water is H2O, two hydrogen, one oxygen. Hydrogen has another form where there's an extra neutron along with the proton in the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Still only one charged particle, the proton, and therefore only one negative electron surrounding it, and therefore the chemical aspects of it are very much like water, ordinary water. However, as a moderator, so-called, in the can-do style of nuclear reactors, heavy water is much more suitable for moderating the energies of the neutrons that are produced in the chain reaction that powers the reactor. Because there's already a neutron that has been captured forming deuterium and therefore the probability of another one being captured and taken out of the stream of neutrons that have to be reaching other uranium nuclei to continue the chain reaction, that's reduced substantially. There were a number of us that heard about this question of whether or not one could perhaps get enough heavy water to be able to do a very significant measurement to try to understand what had become a puzzle about the neutrinos coming from the sun. There were too few being observed in an experiment that only observed the type of neutrinos, the flavor of neutrinos that are produced in the sun. But the possibility that they changed into other neutrino types, one of the other two types or flavors, uh, was a very significant scientific question. And the availability of heavy water, if it could be obtained, would enable a very major measurement to be made. It would be unequivocal in terms of the question of whether neutrinos were changing from one flavor to another. Amazingly, we had found that Atomic Energy of Canada was willing to loan $300 million worth of this heavy water material, 1,000 tons of it, and that uh, INCO was quite happy for us to uh, do an experiment two kilometers underground in the Creighton Mine near Sudbury. And so the various elements had come together. After we had run the experiment for several years, we had collected enough information of the various bursts of light that we were able to do an analysis that extracted the neutrino signals from the signals that were produced by radioactivity of various forms that are still residual contributions. Fortunately, the experiment worked very well and it was quite, quite a clear signal. But we did not want to be led by the nose to a, one answer or another as we were doing the analysis. And therefore, in various ways, we blinded ourselves to the answer by putting in extra data or only selecting segments of the data to be 
analyzed at the beginning. On one day, we removed the blindness and actually looked at the answer. And so our scientists who were to some degree in Sudbury and other cases around the world connected by the internet, all of a sudden on one day knew the answer. We had discovered that neutrinos do change from the type or flavor produced in the sun to the two other types two thirds of the time. A process that can only happen if these neutrinos have a rest mass which is greater than zero, so that they don't always travel at the speed of light, but they travel close to that speed and they reach us uh, in a way that our observation of them and their ability to change from one flavor to another gave us answers to the fact that they have a mass, that they can change their flavors, both of which were not contained in what had come to be known as the standard model of elementary particles. So basically our measurements made a change in the very basic laws of physics to the best that we understood them. And we had clear evidence for this and were able to write a paper that reported these results. That was a eureka moment. And that more than the Nobel Prize was the moment that our scientists consider significant. It was a wonderful collaboration. We came together, we changed the knowledge we had about the laws of physics at a very fundamental level. And uh, it was indeed a eureka moment for everyone who had worked so hard with their various specialties to accomplish this result. My main motivation has been fundamental science, trying to understand the laws of, uh, of nature, particularly physics laws. But you can't do that without using the most advanced technology that you have available today. In some cases you have to try to advance that technology in order to uh, accomplish what you want to do. And there's a very big correspondence between advances in science and advances in technology. Building a detector the size of a 10-story building, two kilometers underground, in a very active nickel mine taking several thousand tons of ore a day through the same shaft that we traveled in a mine cage along with the miners to bring down all the million parts of this experiment to be assembled under ultra clean conditions to achieve the lowest radioactivity location previously previously achieved. We had to excavate a cavity larger than had ever been done before at this depth. We had to create a bubble of acrylic or plexiglass, five centimeters thick and 12 meters in diameter, really a bubble of this material, out of 120 parts that were small enough to fit within the mine cage and bound and then had to be bonded together in situ. We had to have the latest in light sensing equipment, the latest in computing, the latest in internet communication, the latest in computing analysis, the latest in abilities to collaborate internationally on a large scale experiment. We were pushing the boundaries of technology substantially in the process of doing this. And so whereas it was a breakthrough in fundamental science, it came about through a number of frontier breakthroughs in engineering as well. And that's the story of how science and engineering and technology work together in order to make progress. I'm very proud of the uh, Nobel Prize Award, uh, particularly if it's recognized that I received it on behalf of a broader collaboration. But really, if you ask myself or the members of the collaboration what they are most satisfied with in terms of the entire effort associated with the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, it's the scientific results themselves in terms of the fact that we now know things about our universe that were previously unknown that relate to what makes up our universe at a very basic level. 
The constituent particles that we don't know how to subdivide any further these days, we were able to provide information about neutrinos that simply were unknown before. And that has strong implications to the way in which the universe has evolved from day one. It has implications with respect to our understanding of how the sun burns, which is of importance even in terms of our efforts to develop fusion power here on Earth. Uh, and so it has very broad implications and it is the science that I and our collaboration are most proud of. Although receiving the Nobel Prize, everyone's very pleased about that because it is in a sense a certification that this is significant by a very highly respected international group. We now know a lot more about neutrinos as a result of our measurements, but there's still a lot more to be determined and we're pursuing that as well.